All right, uh, and I'd like to talk today about um, uh, pattern completion, our ability to make inferences from partial information. Uh, Neil uh, Berg uh, also uh, discussed this in the context of forming episodic memories, uh, and I think this ability to uh, make inferences uh, for, uh, and, 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 and complete patterns is a fundamental aspect of cognition and intelligence. And everything I'm going to talk about today uh, concerns the work of two amazing grad students in the lab, Han Lin Tang uh, and Bill uh, Lauder. Um, we not only need to uh, form patterns in order to build episodic memories, but actually I would argue that our ability to make inferences from partial information is a fundamental hallmark of intelligence uh, that we use in a variety of different uh, scenarios, uh, from understanding um, uh, sequences uh, to actually being able to put together and connect the dots uh, in order to understand uh, and interpret and, 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 and uh, uh, music and many other sensory modalities. Uh, even in social interactions, we can read uh, social interactions from just a, a couple of seconds uh, of uh, basic uh, information. Uh, and of course, uh, the, um, my talk will concern uh, our ability to recognize uh, heavily occluded objects and studying pattern completion in the context of uh, visual shape uh, recognition. So we do this uh, uh, all the time. So the, here are uh, a couple of examples of uh, heavily occluded objects and uh, you can still uh, kind of recognize uh, what they are uh, despite the fact that most of the pixels or a lot of the pixels are actually missing. Uh, of course, this becomes easier in the context of a whole image when you have a, a context, uh, uh, and, and that helps a lot in terms of understanding uh, what the uh, objects are. But you can do so even in sort of a, almost uh, a very simple images where you take out all, all the context, and you can occlude objects in a variety of different ways, several of which are illustrated here, uh, uh, including the one here uh, illustrated in part F on the lower uh, right, where you don't even need occluders to be able to make inferences uh, about uh, objects and you can uh, make these uh, uh, type of uh, pattern completion tasks uh, even with uh, very very small amounts of information uh, uh, without any context without any occluders without any stereo without any other uh, of these uh, fancy uh, cues and I'd like to try to ask what are the fundamental uh, biological mechanisms that implement this type of uh, 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 pattern completion phenomenon so I'd like to divide the talk into three parts. Uh, so this is follows the, the star defined by Mar and Pocho in order to understand any problem in vision, but I would argue any problem in cognition in general. We need to work at three different levels, at the behavioral level, at the neurophysiological level, and algorithmic level, which were uh, roughly defined as computational implementation and, and, and representational uh, levels. And I'd like to ask how pattern completion works at these uh, three different uh, levels. So let me start with uh, behavior and just show you some data uh, just to convey the notion that humans are extremely good at pattern completion and being able to make inferences about objects from uh, very, very small amounts of uh, minimal uh, information. So we used a technique called bubbles, where we essentially are deleting parts of objects or, or, or looking at, at, at the world like this. Basically, you have uh, a small bubble through which you look at the world. The more bubbles, the more, part, uh, the more of the object you see. Here's a toy school bus. Uh, when you have uh, 20 bubbles, it's pretty easy to see. When you have four bubbles, it's pretty hard to uh, recognize. So we can titrate the difficulty uh, in, in the task. And we're going to use different levels of uh, uh, occlusion or, or visibility. and, and and, and evaluate how well people can uh, recognize these uh, uh, objects. So here's the basic task. Uh, there's a fixation. There's a, a variable amount of time for, during which an object is uh, presented. And then subjects have to make a five alternative fourth choice categorization task uh, to recognize these uh, objects. And here's the behavioral data. Each of these colors corresponds to one particular SOA, one particular duration of the, uh, of the stimulus uh, uh, on the screen. And on the x-axis, you have the percentage of the object that's visible. So as you move to the right, you have more and more visibility. The task becomes uh, uh, easier. As you move to the left, uh, uh, there's a smaller amount of the object that's visible. Chance here corresponds to uh, 20%. Uh, so you can see that uh, performance uh, is uh, quite robust. Uh, here, uh, even if you uh, essentially show uh, up to 10% of the pixels in the object, uh, people are still performing uh, quite, quite well. So, so it's a, uh, only one in 10 pixels of the object essentially are necessary in order to be able to form uh, uh, the, the whole pattern or at least to recognize in this five-way uh, categorization task uh, what the object uh, uh, is. 
Um, we can also do this not only with this bubble type of experiment, but also showing real occluders. The, thing, the, the task becomes easier when you have real occluders, as illustrated here on the right, but the qualitative conclusions are essentially the same. We can still recognize objects in a very robust way, uh, whether you have uh, occluders or, uh, or, or you don't. So let me now move uh, into the brain and ask what are the neural circuits that are responsible uh, for recognizing this type of heavily occluded uh, uh, objects. And to do so, uh, we took advantage of a relatively rare opportunity that we have to investigate uh, uh, physiological function inside the human brain by virtue of collaborating with neurosurgeons who implant electrodes inside the brain of patients that have epilepsy. The whole purpose of this procedure is to treat the patients for epilepsy and to remove the part of the brain that's responsible for the seizures. This is a pretty uh, uh, well-established by now uh, surgical procedure. It's been going on for decades. Nancy mentioned the work of William Penfield uh, many, many decades ago, also with epileptic uh, uh, patients. Uh, and patients uh, typically stay in the hospital for about one week, and during this one week, uh, we have lots of electrodes in different parts of cortex. The location, number, type, and size of electrodes is not under our control. It's uh, uh, strictly dictated by clinical needs. But we have the unique ability to investigate human brain function that has relatively high spatial uh, resolution, uh, very high temporal resolution, and importantly also with very high signal-to-noise uh, ratio. So, uh, together with many other people, we've shown that there are visually selective signals in different parts of the inferior temporal cortex. These uh, uh, signals are similar to what Nancy has described uh, using functional neuroimaging, as well as what Bob and many others have described using uh, recordings in macaque monkeys. And I'm showing you one example of one of our recordings uh, here, uh, showing the selective response to pictures containing faces. On the y-axis, what you see is the intracranial field potential. This is raw data from one of our electrodes in the inferior temporal gyrus. On the x-axis, you have uh, time. The trough of this signal, in this case, occurs at 150 milliseconds. Each of those gray traces corresponds to a single trial. The gray corresponds to the average of 39 trials where the subject was looking at this uh, particular uh, picture. So we see a very strong visually selective uh, signal. The signal is invariant to transformations of those pictures. I'm not showing that here. We've shown that in many cases, uh, in many studies uh, before. So what happens when you show these heavily occluded objects? When you only have uh, about 10 to 20 percent visibility of the object, what happens with the uh, uh, signals from these electrodes? So now I'm going to show you single trials from the responses of these same electrodes. So here's one response to that uh, particular picture. And you can see uh, just uh, uh, in the raw data that even though we are only showing a very small amount of information, the, so the response from, from this electrode is very, very similar to the one that we have for whole objects. Here are a few more uh, single trials. And you can see that despite uh, that the fact that there is some heterogeneity from one trial to another, we can still see selectivity uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this type of uh, uh, signal. And uh, I'm pointing out here the latency of the response. How, what's the trough of the, uh, uh, of, of the voltage uh, as a function of uh, 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 stimulus onset? And you can see that in all of these uh, single trial examples that I'm showing you, uh, there is a consistent delay with respect to the latency that we observe for uh, whole uh, objects. In a couple of cases, we used a fixed position of the bubbles, so we repeated the same uh, stimulus with the same position uh, of the bubbles. Here are four trials with a fixed position of the bubbles, showing that there's a consistent response uh, uh, to those uh, four presentations. Again, that's visually selective and delayed with respect to the presentation of the whole. Just to convince you that I'm not picking a few individual trials that looked uh, nice, I'm going to show you all the trials and the responses from this uh, uh, electrode. So here are the responses to the whole images. Again, this is uh, completely raw data. There's no uh, maneuvering uh, uh, with the data here. Each of these lines corresponds to a single uh, trial. The color corresponds to the uh, voltage, uh, and the x-axis here corresponds to uh, time. Uh, there were five different uh, faces presented. Those are divided by these uh, horizontal lines and multiple repetitions of each of those uh, faces. So you can see even with your naked eye that there's a pretty strong signal. There's something that happens in the voltage of this electrode in response to these whole objects. There's nothing tremendously new here. People have seen this uh, over and over uh, multiple, uh, multiple times uh, uh, before. 
So now when we present those uh, partial objects, the ones that, uh, where we only show about 10 to 20 percent of the, uh, of the object, again we see a strong uh, visually selective signal that's connoted by this blue and red in these uh, traces. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the signal. The pictures are different from one trial to the next because of the position of the bubbles. And despite this heterogeneity, there's a pretty strong visually selective signal in all of these uh, cases. The, when we present the partial fixed condition, meaning that we have uh, partial objects but we use exactly the same position of the bubbles, the signal becomes much, uh, much more consistent, not as consistent as with the whole objects, but much more consistent. Uh, and we can see that in all the cases where we have partial object information, uh, there's a delay of about 50 milliseconds or so in processing uh, 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 in, in, in the onset of this visually selective uh, signal. We're particularly interested in this type of delays because they point to uh, a significant constraint in our computational understanding of what's going on in terms of pattern completion. Bob already mentioned this uh, in, in his multiple studies about attention and how different areas interact. In this case, we're interpreting these delays as, the no, uh, as uh, implying that maybe there is a need for additional computations uh, in order to be able to perform this type of uh, pattern uh, completion. So we conjecture that these uh, initial, uh, uh, that, that these additional uh, uh, computations may involve the need for either top-down signals and or recurrent connections to be able to do pattern completion. So one of the uh, sort of uh, poor man's uh, tools to investigate um, uh, these uh, recurrent and or top-down co uh, connections at the behavioral level has been the use of a protocol called backward masking. Essentially, you show a picture and you very briefly, uh, uh, very soon afterwards, you show a mask after that. Uh, and depending on the intensity of that mask and depending on the temporal uh, contiguity between the stimulus and the, and, and the mask, you can disrupt processing. You can either completely interrupt processing or in some cases you can uh, essentially interrupt the feed-forward path uh, according to uh, many theories uh, as, as uh, uh, outlined uh, here. So to the extent that backward masking interrupts additional computations, potentially interrupting uh, recurrent and or top-down signals, we conjecture that backward masking would interfere with the ability to perform uh, pattern completion. So we went back to behavior and we did a behavioral experiment with a backward mask. So here's the data that I've uh, shown you before, showing the uh, performance uh, in object recognition as a function of uh, what fraction of the object is uh, visible. And here's the same uh, uh, case uh, where now uh, we introduce a, a mask at different uh, uh, SOAs, different stimulus onset asynchronous with respect to stimulus onset. So we see that if the SOA is pretty long, about 150 milliseconds or so, uh, there's no impairment in performance. We recapitulate the, the results from the previous experiment. However, when the mask occurs within about 25 milliseconds uh, or to 50 milliseconds of stimulus onset, we see that performance gets uh, significantly uh, degraded. So together with the physiological delays that I showed you, uh, in the previous slide, we take this as indication uh, that there is a need for additional computations, perhaps recurrent and top-down computations, needed in order to be able to implement uh, pattern uh, completion. Uh, so here's the summary of uh, behavioral performance uh, as a function of the uh, SOA. In the case of uh, uh, when, when there's no masking, uh, this is the, 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 the top line, uh, and in the case where there is backward masking, and you can see how backward masking significantly disrupts behavioral uh, performance. Uh, all of this is done with this bubbles experiment. Uh, basically, the same results hold if you use uh, real occluders, and, and that's shown uh, in, in, in here. So now let me try to put together these two worlds. I told you about behavioral and the behavioral effects of masking. I told you that at the behavioral level, masking uh, uh, interferes with performance. I told you at the physiological level, there's a delay. Uh, and now I'm going to correlate this, uh, the, these two worlds. Mind you, I'm going to do this in different subjects. We didn't do the backward masking experiment with the epilepsy subject, so I'm going to correlate data from uh, different subjects in this case. So I show you the behavioral, uh, the, the physiological delay. So we, from that we can measure uh, the amount of time that it takes to, uh, uh, to elicit a visually selective signal uh, from partial uh, uh, images. And that's uh, shown in here. I told you that this is variable and it depends on the position of the bubble. So there are some images that are easier to recognize, other images that are harder to recognize at the physiological level. And the same thing happens at the behavioral level. So at the behavioral level we can measure performance as a function of SOA and measure the area under the curve as an indication of how easy it is to recognize that particular image. So we did a whole psychophysics experiment 
with the data from one of our lectures. So we took the, the exact position of the bubbles from that experiment, and we then conducted a psychophysical experiment inspired and guided by the position of the bubbles in the physiology experiment to measure the behavioral reaction times or the behavioral uh, effects of masking, in this case, uh, for each of the same uh, images. And we found that there is a, a weak but significant correlation between how difficult a particular image is uh, and, uh, and the behavioral uh, reaction times. Again, this is at the single image uh, level. And mind you, we were looking at the, uh, two, two completely different uh, sets of subjects. So despite all of this uh, 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 variation, there's still a correlation between uh, the behavioral uh, world and the physiological world in this case. So we next turn our attention to the computational uh, models and how, can, uh, how these uh, effects of pattern completion be explained uh, uh, using our, standard, our understanding of uh, visual recognition models. And we used uh, a battery of uh, well-established uh, computational models for, uh, for object recognition. Uh, at the top here, I'm uh, showing one particular implementation of the type of models that Tommy Poggio has been developing uh, for, for a long time now. In this particular case, this is the implementation by uh, Thomas Sir. Uh, uh, and then on the bottom, I'm showing you uh, one relatively recent implementation of a deep network uh, that in 2012 was the winner of, uh, uh, in the ImageNet competitions, uh, where you bombard these models with uh, uh, millions of images uh, from, from, from internet, and then we you try to tweak these parameters to improve the top five performance in these uh, type of models. I'm not going to have time to do uh, justice to describe these models in much detail for people who have never heard about these type of models. Suffice to say that these are purely bottom-up models. They involve the concatenation of linear and nonlinear steps. Uh, and in the case of the top model, there are zero free parameters. We're not tweaking the parameters based on the images. In the case of the bottom model, there are lots of parameters that you're tweaking in order to try to improve performance on a set of objects, and then you cross-validate on a different uh, set of objects in order to try to improve recognition of uh, whole objects. So we asked how well these models perform uh, in recognizing the same images that we used in the behavioral and physiological experiments, and that's shown uh, in, in here. So again, on the y-axis, we have performance, either of human or uh, of models. And on the x-axis, we have the percentage of uh, visibility. The black line here on the top is human performance. That's what I've shown you before. Pixels perform uh, terribly, so if you just take pixels and you try to do object recognition with pixels, that doesn't work at all. Uh, if you do uh, use HMAX or um, uh, what's called pool five, one of the intermediate levels in these uh, deep convolutional networks, they perform better and significantly above chance, but they still struggle significantly when you're trying to extrapolate from these very, very small amounts of uh, visual uh, information. Even the top performing model, in, uh, in, in, uh, at least in, uh, in, in uh, uh, called AlexNet, uh, still significantly underperformed uh, uh, humans. So based on the behavioral and physiological studies, uh, we conjecture that the problem uh, was that the representation of these uh, uh, models is not robust to these uh, uh, significant degrees of uh, uh, occlusion, and that there's a need for additional computation. So just to give a hint for what's going on, this is a particular low dimensional rendering of the representation of these high dimensional models for each of the objects. So each point here corresponds to one of the objects that we uh, tested. There are chairs and fruits and faces and, 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 and so on. And all of this is um, uh, in a very high dimensional uh, space uh, with uh, about 5,000 different features, for example, in the context of uh, FC7. Instead of visualizing this 5,000 dimensional space, we used a technique called stochastic uh, neighborhood embedding here to render all of those in, uh, in a 2D uh, plot. So here, the open circles uh, correspond to the whole objects. So you see that uh, it's relatively easy to separate these uh, different categories of stimuli based on this uh, representation. And indeed, uh, these feedforward models work very well in uh, separating and recognizing uh, this type of um, uh, uh, whole objects. But when we use the partial objects, we see that the representation is uh, cluttered and also very different from the representation to the whole objects, showing uh, or, or providing some hints as to why it's very hard from these purely feedforward models to extrapolate from these partial objects onto the whole uh, uh, objects. The computational uh, distance, so, so we measure the distance from uh, what each of these exemplars to the category mean as a way of saying how hard it is for this computational model to recognize these partially occluded uh, objects, how distinct those representations are. 
And again, we find that this, uh, uh, um, uh, with, with this computational distance uh, is weakly but significantly correlated with the neural latency. So we look at each single image, each single rendering of, uh, of these uh, uh, occluded objects. We measure how long it takes to recognize, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, elicit a selective signal at the physiological level, that's on the x-axis, and we measure the computational difficulty for that image on the y-axis, and we find that there's a, a, a weak but significant correlation between the computational uh, and, the, uh, and the physiological data. So, I argue that at the behavioral level and at the physiological level that there's a need for additional computations. I also uh, argue that purely bottom-up models do not seem to be very well and they significantly underperform with respect to humans in recognizing these heavily occluded objects. So we conjecture that the additional computations that we need involve recurrent computations, that you need to be able to make, in order to make these type of inferences, uh, you need to be able to either use top-down and or recurrent information. And one of the main models that have been proposed uh, many years ago uh, to be able to do uh, error correction or pattern completion is the type of Hopfield network uh, uh, roughly illustrated here. So these are all to all connect uh, networks. So there's massive recurrence. They're connected all to all. And it turns out that under some conditions, uh, you can show that these type of models can be very good at, uh, at pattern completion and at, at, at sort of building uh, specific attractors and, and, and shifting the dynamics of the system from partial information onto these uh, attractors. And I'm not going to have time to do justice uh, to this. Some of you are probably very familiar with these type of models. If you're not, you can just think of this as uh, uh, basically a, a, a landscape uh, in, in, in energy world uh, where you have attractors that are defining the objects that you want to recognize. And when you start in the middle of nowhere, when you start with an object that's heavily occluded, uh, you, the, the, uh, the dynamics of the system are, are, are such that basically you attract the... Uh, the object onto one of these uh, 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 well-defined uh, attractor uh, states. Uh, importantly, in this particular uh, rendering, uh, so, so this is a schematic of what I just told you. Imagine that we have uh, three neurons. In the brain, of course, there are many more. In the models, there are many more. Uh, so, so each of these axes here now uh, indicates the representation of uh, objects by these three neurons. Um, so in, that, in this case, we are trying to recognize four different objects, four different prototypes. Uh, and our representation of that object ends up because it's heavily occluded, not in one of those uh, exact prototypes, but somewhere in between because it's heavily occluded. So the dynamics of the system will be such that that object will be pulled towards one of those uh, uh, attractors. So that's, that's the intuition of what's, uh, uh, what we're trying to uh, accomplish. And importantly, in this particular uh, implementation of this uh, system, we have zero free parameters. So we're not trying to uh, tune parameters uh, to the system. We take one of these feed-forward architectures that were trained based on images on the net. This is uh, AlexNet and or the HMAX implementation. And at the top level of that hierarchy, we implement the Hopfield network. This Hopfield network uh, has uh, attractor states that are purely defined by the whole objects, uh, and they are well defined according to an equation whereby you define the weights uh, that are symmetric, and they're exclusively based on the features of the whole uh, object. So we're not trying to tune and, uh, and fit specific parameters. This slide is horrible. I apologize for that. It's very hard to see. There are lots of lines, lots of different models that we tried. Again, on the x-axis, we have the performance. On the, uh, on the x-axis, we have the percentage of the object that's visible. On the y-axis, performance. Uh, you have a human performance there uh, uh, on the top. FC7 is highlighted uh, there. This is the performance of the purely bottom-up model. And I'm showing you FC7 plus this attractor network. So we only have recurrency in one level of the hierarchy, and this already significantly improves the performance of these uh, bottom-up models. We're still not at human performance level uh, with this attractor network, but again, even without using any, uh, any, any type of uh, parameter tuning, just adding this recurrency uh, and these additional computations on these feed four models, we can improve uh, performance. We can improve performance uh, uh, even much more if we allow ourselves to train with these uh, occluded uh, 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 objects. In order to ensure that we're not overfitting, we train on some objects, we test on other objects, so we do cross-validation across objects. But now we have this uh, FC7 uh, uh, representation, and we add, add these recurrent connections, which are not dictated by the attractor model, but they're actually trained based on the object. We're trying to minimize the distance between the final representation of the object after all of these uh, dynamics and the representation of the, uh, uh, of the whole object. 
Uh, so if we do that, then let me go back to this uh, 2D representation based on, uh, uh, on SNE, the stochastic neighborhood uh, embedding. This is what I showed you happens at the beginning. And then over time, the representation of the partial objects, the, the field circles, becomes closer and closer uh, to the representation of the uh, occluded objects. And then if we measure performance as a function of the, ob uh, of the amount of visibility, we have this RNN model, which is now trained on the occluded objects and which achieves uh, human-level uh, performance. So we can recapitulate uh, performance, uh, human performance for heavily occluded uh, uh, objects uh, by just adding uh, one step of uh, recurrency that's trained on these, uh, uh, on, on these objects. Uh, in addition to showing uh, performance, uh, uh, we also looked at the correlation at the image by image level. So what are the mistakes that humans make? What are the mistakes that the computational uh, models make? So for that purpose, uh, we measure uh, the performance of the RNN model versus the performance of uh, uh, human subjects on the exact same uh, images. We can see that at the beginning, there is no correlation. As a matter of fact, there is an inverse correlation. And if anyone is interested, we can discuss why that's uh, the case. And as we go through the different steps of these uh, recurrent computations, the correlation uh, at the single image level uh, increases. The correlation is clearly not perfect. You can point to lots of images where the humans get it right and the computational model does not, and, 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 and vice versa. But there's a significant increase in uh, the degree of correlation between the model and humans. As a matter of fact, if we just average and you measure the average correlation between humans as a function of uh, time step in this recurrent computation, you can see the increase in correlation that I was uh, referring to. Uh, and the dashed line there is the correlation between humans. So if you ask one person to recognize objects, uh, the heavily occluded objects, and you compare the performance with another object, the correlation is not one. Humans are capricious uh, devices, and they also have uh, their own uh, preferences, and they also perform differently. So here's the correlation between, uh, two, uh, uh, between different humans. This is where we are right now with this uh, recurrent uh, uh, network. So we're in, uh, as, 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 as a function of how much recurrency there is, uh, there's a significant improvement in the correlation with humans at the single image level, not only at the overall performance level, uh, but there's still certainly a gap in order to be able to explain uh, totally the human-human uh, correlations in uh, recognizing um, uh, 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 patterns uh, from partial information. So to summarize, uh, I talked at uh, three different levels. I discussed at the computational, at the implementation, and at the algorithm level some of the basic ideas about how we can make inferences from very, very small amounts of information in the context of visual recognition. So the behavioral level, uh, I argue that recognition is quite robust. Uh, you can take out about 90% of uh, information about an object and still recognize it. And I also told you that if you do backward masking, if you present the image very fast and you immediately put a mask, uh, you can significantly disrupt uh, performance. And we took uh, this as a suggestive indication that you need additional computations, perhaps recurrency and top-down, uh, in order to be able to recognize these heavily occluded objects. Uh, I argue that uh, if we put electrodes inside a human brain and we we'll look at activity in the inferior temporal cortex, we get neural signals that are uh, robust to heavy amounts of uh, occlusion, so we still obtain selectivity, uh, but the signals are significantly delayed, and uh, the delay is uh, in proportion to the amount of occlusion and in proportion to difficulty, and also correlates weakly but significantly with the behavioral data. I then argued at the computational level that purely bottom-up models seem to be uh, insufficient to fully explain our ability to make this type of uh, inferences from uh, partial information, and that we need recurrent computations to solve the problem of uh, pattern uh, completion. And showed you a toy example where we implement recurrency at the top of these uh, uh, bottom-up models and rescue performance uh, in recognizing whole uh, objects. So I'm going to stop there and then mention once, uh, one more time uh, Han Lin Tang and Bill Lotter, the two amazing students who have actually done all this work.